business. Well, my next guest is one of the few survivors of the dot-com bubble back in the year 2000. He started Catcher.com in 1999, but had to abort his IPO as the Nasdaq crashed. But then he managed to turn around and save his company. Well, today, he's a pretty well-known entrepreneur in Asia and one of our youngest millionaires with a net worth of about $70 million. Patrick Grove says Australian online businesses should be looking towards Southeast Asia for investment opportunities. Let's find out why. He joins us now from our Melbourne studios. Patrick, welcome to the show this afternoon. Uh, we here focus a lot on China and India, and that's quite natural given our, our resources focus, if you like. Uh, but you say that places like Indonesia, for example, and other areas in Southeast Asia, that's the place to be. Why is that? Look, I mean, I, I, I love it that people look at China and India and it means that there's less people focusing on Southeast Asia. Uh, one, of the, you know, one of the things I love about Southeast Asia that people really you know, can't seem to get their head around is, is the sheer number of people there. I mean, if you look at smartphone penetration, which is a, which is a topic that we look at a lot, in the next two years, there's going to be 300 million people running around Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, and so on, you know, with smartphones. That's an iPhone, that's a Blackberry, that's a Samsung, and so on. Whereas you look at a market like Australia, you know, which is sizable and people can build decent businesses, you're looking at maybe 20 million people with smartphones. So you're looking at Australia, 20 million people with smartphones. You're looking at Southeast Asia, 300 million people with smartphones. I mean, there's a huge opportunity there for technology entrepreneurs to take advantage of. Let me put two things to you then. The first is, yes, population is growing, but isn't the fact that the infrastructure in these countries still isn't uh, really at a level where technology companies can take advantage of it? I mean, I mean you could say that, but I mean, when you look at... Um, you look at web services, you look at mobile apps, I mean, it's, it's people are there, people are using it. I mean, from a distance, it looks like people don't. But I mean, if you look at, if you talk to Twitter, you talk to Facebook, and you look at what are the three most popular countries in the world for mobile usage for these services, it is Manila, it is Jakarta, it is Bangkok. So these are people already in the ground in these cities. Right. Um, you're generating huge amounts of, of user volume on, on these services. So, I mean, the markets are ready. Uh, the infrastructure is there and, and, and people have the phones and people have the connectivity. It's just a matter of entrepreneurs and investors putting the right products in their hands. I didn't actually think that 3G or 4G uh, connectivity was really great in these places. But are you essentially saying that this is simply a volume game, that the population increase over the next 10, 20 years is going to be so significant that we can't afford to ignore it? Look, I mean, that's one, but I mean, you don't, even have, you don't even have to talk about population increase. I mean, you talk about the population there today. Uh, you know, you're looking at today something like 100 million smartphone users. And that's today, as in right now. It's already a market five times bigger than Australia. Um, the other great thing that I love about these markets is that, you know, any online business model is, is usually five to six years behind the development of Australia. So, I mean, you can very easily look for ideas that work in Australia and bring them to Indonesia, bring them to the Philippines over the next couple of years and, and you're going to be tapping onto a market that that very likely there isn't someone doing that idea and and secondly there's there's 300 million people ready to adopt whatever whatever it is that that you're doing now look this isn't a, a new idea patrick going into asia and uh, we hear a lot about the growth in those regions what do you think is holding australian business online startups what is holding them back from making that step you know it's it's a really good question and i try to ask myself that all the time i, I think it's <laughs> It, it's almost like a New Year's resolution. A lot of people make the New Year's resolution, I'm going to lose weight this year, I'm going to quit smoking this year, or maybe from an entrepreneur point of view, it's, you know, I'm going to do something in Asia this year. And, and you know how most New Year's resolutions work out a month later, you forget what your resolution was. So I, I think it, it's something that a lot of people wish that they would do. But it, look, you just got to get on a plane, you got to move to Asia, and you got to make it happen. You know, I, I was living in Australia 14 years, ago, 14 years ago, and I did exactly that. I just got on a plane moved to Singapore and, and, and didn't come back. And so, I, you know, I believe that if, if you want to build a business that taps onto the 300 million people that, that are going to be using your product, you, you just got to go there. So you're saying essentially that they can't run the business from here, they have to move to an Asian region? Completely not. You've, you've just got to be there. You've got to be on the ground. And, and, you, and, and you, just, you just can't make things happen remotely. I mean, I know it's a digital world and you can Skype and you can email, but, you know, when you're building a business, you, you just got to be there. Now, you're investing $150 million yourself in, into ASEAN online businesses. What has caught your eye in this space? Look, I mean, it, it, it's, it really isn't rocket science. I mean, we look very closely at what works in, in the developed markets. So we look at America, we look at Europe, we look at Japan, we look at Australia, and, and ideas that work there. I look, if it works in all of those markets, it is mm. definitely going to work in Southeast Asia. I mean, the two 
ideas or the two companies that we've been involved in with growing. One is iProperty, which is which is essentially an ASEAN version of realestate.com.au. Right. Another company that we're involved in and, and, and founded is iCar Asia, which is essentially a, an ASEAN version of, of car sales.com.au. So I mean, so these are proven concepts. These are huge companies in Australia that have done fabulously well over the last several years and, and, and we're recreating those business models in ASEAN as we speak. And let me put to you very quickly, Patrick, uh, shares in Catcher Media, your own company listed in Malaysia, fallen by 15%. CIMB says you're undervalued, but also part of the reason is uh, Malaysian investors don't really understand the, the tech space. So there is some, some ignorance and some reticence, if you like, even amongst Asian investors to dip their toes in the water. Correct. So I mean, well, I mean, what we've seen is that because because the business models are sort of, sort of five, seven years behind, then we find that the investing public there as well are, you know, they're they're not on top of you know what investment opportunities from a technology point of view are worth investing. You know, they they, they haven't seen sort of what works and what doesn't work. They just look at what's in Asia now. So right. that's where we see the opportunities. I mean, entrepreneurs are not taking advantage of what works, and at the same time, investors are not taking advantage of what works. And and we just say, look, just look at what works overseas and bring it to ASEAN. Very simple model. Opportunities abound. Patrick, thanks for your time today. Thanks so much, Nigel. Well, that's